Hey, so guys, interested in mitochondrial transplant? Uh, important topic, especially because it's a new chapter completely. Uh, so I thought that I will uh, make sure that I take a new chapter for you guys. And uh, otherwise, it's nothing very difficult. Simple concepts. You are going to be uh, understanding it better if you understand liver transplant as well. So, interesting transplants are rare. They are not usually performed uh, all over the world. There have been only a couple of transplants which have been performed in India. And uh, the what you see in textbook is not actually going to be the reality because indications in India are slightly more different than what is the indications all over the world. Uh, in India, we don't have a high rate of pediatric intestinal transplants as well. Most of the cases are done in um, adults. And uh, short ball syndrome is again the most common reason for intestinal transplant in India and also in the West. For that matter. So let's start with the questions. Uh, which of the following is not true regarding indications for intestinal transplant? So complications of parental nutrition for irreversible intestinal failure is the most common uh, indication. Is this true or false? Okay, let's look at the second option. Intestinal transplant for patients on parental nutrition is reserved only for those with life-threatening complications. See, in patients with IFALD, who can expand what is IFALD? What is IFALD? Yes, it is intestinal failure associated liver disease. Liver containing graft is indicated only in severe fibrosis or cirrhosis. Okay, let's see. Acute widespread splanchnic ischemia is an indication for urgent intestinal and multivessel transplant. I think uh, so. What is the right answer? Kind of think about it and tell me. A couple of you said it is B. It is B because intestinal transplant for patients on parental nutrition is reserved, not only reserved for people with life threatening complications, it used to be reserved only for patients with life-threatening complications. This was during the period when intestinal transplants had low success rates. As the success rates of transplant increase, we began to do it for multiple indications, which included improving quality of life, not just life-threatening conditions. So these are the UK guidelines. So this might be a little confusing in the sense that uh, it's quite a large table and uh, what you might assume is that how do I, you know, kind of go about reading all this? Do I need to read all of this? So if you look at it, there can be multiple MCQs which can be framed over here. So the complications of parental nutrition, progressive IAFLD or non-IAFLD. So how do you assess the complications of parental nutrition? So it can be assessed by biochemistry and biopsy. What kind of biopsy would you be taking? You will be taking a liver biopsy. Sepsis is an indication for this thing. So sepsis per se is not an indication for any other type of transplant other than intestinal transplant. In other cases, you will try to control the sepsis and then plan for surgery. In intestinal transplants, sepsis itself is an indication for the uh, intestinal transplant. What is the reason? Because the cause of the reason, cause of the sepsis itself is continued parental nutrition. So coming to this question, if a patient goes in for liver disease, how long can a person stay anapatic? How long? Oh, this is not an MCQ question. I don't think this is there in your book. But how long can a person stay without a liver? Oh, yeah. Great. It's actually 24 to 48 hours. Yeah. 24 to 48 hours is the this thing. One to two days is the maximum per time a person can stay anapatic. Anyway, so coming to this thing. So when you're looking at causes of sepsis in intestine as an indication for intestinal transplant, it is mainly two types of sepsis. One is catheter related sepsis in which no remediable cause can be identified. When you mean no remediable cause, the remediable causes include uh, causes where you can change the catheters. You put a new central venous catheter or you can try to, you know, uh, uh, get a different line. And then endocarditis. Endocarditis is a very common problem in 
uh, catheter associated sepsis or other metastatic infection these patients often suffer from metastatic infections because their immunity is already suppressed because of short bowel syndrome and why do they uh, and short bowel syndrome is the reason why you wish uh, for which you know you are giving parenteral nutrition the complications of sepsis are reducing slowly with time because of better uh, preparations in parental nutrition of course i am not going to be talking about this over here we will be discussing this in the nutrition class but yes limited central venous access <laughs> so venous access sites limited to three major conventional sites in adults above and below the diaphragm and two major conventional sites above the diaphragm in children so what do you mean by a conventional venous site so it can mean internal jugular subclavian and femoral vein so what they kind of say is that when you lose these sites when you know you have only these sites available it itself can be an indication for intestinal transplant now this is a lifestyle cause quality of life this does not mean when the venous access is limited that the patient is going to go in for immediate death here you are doing this thing because to prevent further episodes of sepsis okay so this is the reason why you kind of want to uh, make sure that when the venous sites are limited you want to make sure that preemptively you do an intestinal transplant when this is done this is not done in patients who know the need for parental nutrition is expected to be short you do this in young men or women who are expected to live for a long time and you want to improve their quality of life by doing a transplant again very poor quality of life thought to be correctable by transplantation surgery to remove a large portion of the abdominal viscera considered untenable without associated multivisceral transplantation so the most common indication for this is going to be two things extensive desmoid disease and extensive critical mesenteric ischemia when you mean extensive mesenteric ischemia it most often means situations where you will have to remove two vessels sometimes celiac uh, what do you call superior mesenteric artery and inferior mesenteric artery sometimes celiac also so in these cases you can uh, do an emergency associated multivisceral transplantation localized malignancy considered amenable to uh, curative resection requiring extensive evisceration so many of these neuroendocrine tumors start off in the intestine sometimes in the pancreas they might uh, metastasize to the liver or multiple local areas spread here you might feel that the patient is going to survive with good amount of resection as we discussed in the previous class patients in whom neuroendocrine tumor with metastasis they can be considered as ideal candidates for liver metastasectomy which means that in extensive metastasis you might have to remove a significant portion of the liver and also the intestine and these kind of situations transplant can be done however it is not very common when the transplantation procedure is preclude is expected to preclude the possibility of future intestinal transplantation uh, example loss of venous access or further human leukocyte antigen so the thing is that um whenever you are planning for uh, a transplant and you feel that uh this patient this patient is going to need um, uh, multiple procedures in future we patient might require future intestinal transplantation where that is you are anticipating the need for future intestinal transplantation and do it again this is not a very common indication but this has been mentioned as an indication in the uk where the need for subsequent intestinal transplantation is considered likely and the risk of death is increased by excluding the intestine from graft so this is cases in which you are planning some other transplant for example it could be a uh, renal transplant and the patient has extensive atherosclerotic disease so a patient with renal transplant with extensive atherosclerosis you do an abdominal uh, doppler Or, or a CT or an MR angiogram, and you find that therefore there are multiple plaques in his abdominal aorta, which could likely 
from an embolus or extend as a thrombus to this SMA or celiac axis, which means that he is going to be at an extremely high risk for mesenteric ischemia. If you do a renal transplant in this patient, this patient is also in renal failure, without doing a subsequent intestinal transplant, you might cure or you might, you know, reverse his renal failure, but you generally don't reverse his atherosclerotic state where he is likely to get a transplant. So this also can be considered as a cause or an indication for uh, intestinal transplant. Or transplantation of additional organs often for feasibility reasons. So again, uh, here is where, uh, uh, you know, we, they are talking about uh, you can do a intestinal transplant in patients. You know, other transplants are also being considered where uh, same thing. It's basically the uh, explanation of what I gave in the sixth itself. So again, Complications from parental nutrition for intestinal uh, failure are the most common, well-established indications for intestinal transplantation. Short ball syndrome is the most for frequent need for parental nutrition. So the causes in the pediatric population and in the adult population can be varied. Volvulus, gastroschisis, necrotizing enterocolitis, intestinal dysmotility, or pseudo obstruction. Adults, bowel resection due to mesenteric ischemia, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, most probably due to Crohn's because multiple segments are affected, benign tumor resection, which is desmoid, dysmotility or pseudo obstruction. Until recently, intestinal transplant was considered only for patients with complications of parental nutrition, but increasingly patients are being treated for quality of life indications. So at this point of time, you might ask me from an MCQ point of view, what is the most common cause for short bowel syndrome in children or in adults? In various books, various information is given. In some books, it is given as gastroschisis. In some books, it is given as necrotizing enterocolitis. In some books, it is given as uh, uh, intestinal dysmotility, pseudo obstruction, multiple reasons. Uh, again, in adults also, uh, is it mesenteric ischemia or Crohn's disease? Various books follow various things, uh, but uh, this particular study is something which is, uh, it is a 2001 study. It is a little old study only. But this is from a textbook of intestinal transplantation, one of the standard textbooks of intestinal transplantation. This particular textbook says that volvulus is the most common cause for transplantation in children. And gastroschisis follows closely. Necrotizing enterocolitis is a common, uh, 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 you know, uh, also a common reason. This is slightly different from what is the most common cause for short ball syndrome. What I have mentioned here is the most common indication for intestinal transplant. Volvulus is not the most common cause for short ball syndrome. It is either gastroschisis or necrotizing enterocolitis, depending on the population. But volvulus overall is one of the most common indications for intestinal transplant in children. It is one of the most common causes for intestinal transplant. Okay, now you, uh, I think there's a slight difference over here. If you want me to explain again, I can explain again. Most common cause for pediatric transplant is SBS. And the most common indication for transplant. Among its causes of SBS is volvulus. This is not equal to most common cause of SBS. The most common cause of SBS in multiple textbooks is written as gastroschisis or necrotizing enterocolitis. Again, it depends on the population, which population you are actually dealing with. In the Indian population, in where the uh, screening capabilities are lower, they believe that gastroschisis is higher. In the Western population, because these children are screened at a very early stage, necrotizing enterocolitis is said to be higher. But of course, this is a very controversial topic, what you should write during exam. But this particular information is from a textbook of intestinal transplantation. And here, the most common cause for intestinal transplant is volvulus. In this, we are talking about children only. 
any doubts over here okay we'll proceed in adults the most common indication is ischemia mesenteric ischemia followed by crohn's again this is also a little population based study but this is again western statistics say that mesenteric ischemia is the most common indication for transplantation in uh, adults do we do a associated liver transplant as well if you kind of looked at over there in the previous slide what are the most common indication for liver transplant is parent and nutrition associated liver disease at this point of time intestinal failure associated liver disease if that is the most common indication for liver transplant sorry intestinal transplant then logic says that liver transplant should automatically be done however that is not the case when people with ia even in patients with iafnd an intestinal transplant can decrease or reverse early fibrosis so this term ifand is a very broad terminology it is usually determined by liver biopsy uh, fibro scan elastography and all that sort of stuff but mild to moderate liver fibrosis where the fibro scan scores are lesser an isolated intestinal transplant can be done and it improves patient outcomes along with reversal of liver fibrosis we discussed fatty liver disease similarly uh, certain drugs also can you know uh, uh, help in reversal of fatty liver uh, ifal however if the degree of cirrhosis is very high or it is severe liver fibrosis it usually necessitates a liver containing graft there have been anecdotal reports where they do what is an apoid as we saw discussed last time when we were discussing liver transplant a uh, part of the donor liver was retained they also transplanted uh, sorry a part of the recipient liver was retained they transplanted a donor liver okay uh, somebody has asked me explain point number 1 please if indication is intestinal failure associated liver disease the degree of liver impairment influences the organs required at transplant ifa ld again i am going to explain this ifa ld is a broad term extending from fatty infiltration to full blown liver failure with with portal hypertension in early mild to moderate liver fibrosis a isolated intestinal transplant can reverse the need for can reverse liver fibrosis how does it do the parenteral nutrition the high fat content of the parenteral nutrition is essentially what is responsible for the uh, fatty infiltration and the liver failure and the liver disease when you transplant the intestine alone the patient's nutrition improves his need for parenteral nutrition decreases which means that patient outcomes are improved and liver uh, a reversal of liver fibrosis with discontinuation of parenteral nutrition in patients in whom the liver fibrosis is severe these patients will need a liver containing graft because these patients are most likely to go in for uh, uh, full blown liver failure with portal hypertension hepatic cirrhosis with extensive potomesenteric thrombosis so in patients we you know they have cirrhosis with severe portal vein thrombosis smv thrombosis isolated liver transplantation becomes very impossible technically impossible so multivisceral transplantation may be considered so this is in patients in whom they might not be in actual intestinal failure but you might transplant a portion of the intestine along with the superior mesenteric vein and the superior mesenteric vein especially so that the liver graft itself survives well this is in patients with extensive porto mesenteric thrombosis acute widespread splanchnic ischemia arterial and venous is a rare but growing indication for superurgent intestinal and multivisceral transplant people who have worked in government colleges as a sr or as a final year resident you might have operated on cases in which you might see triple vessel disease uh, when i mean triple vessel disease i am not the, what talking about the one in the heart 
I'm talking about you know celiac vessel thrombosis, uh, SMA thrombosis, and IMA thrombosis. So what do you do in these cases? I'm seeing a lot of yes. Yeah, at least two vessels you would have seen. You open the stomach is completely black. The colon is also black. Rectum is also black. What do you do in these cases? Do you resect? It drains. No point of drain, man. Not even drain. If there's a severe thing in our settings, open and close. So that is the answer. End of care pathway. In all these cases, I have seen a couple of them uh, in during my residency time. After residency, I've not seen much. All I do is you open, put a drain, and close. You really can't do anything much in our government hospital settings. There is no major scope for uh, parental nutrition also because these patients are likely to go in for sepsis unless you remove the gangrenous portion. And even if you remove it, you know you can't uh, uh, um, uh, remove from right from uh, stomach to the uh, rectum. It's going to be survival is going to be impossible. So in these patients, we you know kind of uh, tell the attenders that uh, the end is near and uh, try to give some supportive care. So uh, these are actually indications. These type of patients are indications for urgent emergency multivessel transplantation. This is done in very few centers. Your patient is being planned for an interstitial multivessel transplant for IFALD, which of the following will not be a routinely part. I think you guys are very clear. A venous mapping is essential because vascular anatomy is uh, super important. You need might need to do a Doppler, CT or an MR angiogram. Liver biopsy, obviously, because that is one of the most common uh, you know, indications for intestinal transplant. Renal biopsy is not a part of the regular workup. Cross-sectional imaging is basically CT abdomen. You will not be approaching any case without this. So again, there's nothing much to talk about here, but all patients require a liver biopsy, detailed venous mapping. It can be done by a CT or an MR angiogram. Cardiac and respiratory uh, assessment needs to be done. Cardiac assessment includes uh, echo, uh, echocardiogram, even stress uh, echocardiography can be done. Endoscopies are also done in certain cases if you're planning for extensive resections and you want to have a look at, you want to do an esophagogastric anastomosis. You want to have a look at the lower esophagus to see if are there any varices or not. Because if there's a varices and you're planning to do an esophagogastric anastomosis, it becomes very difficult. Renal function assessment is important. You don't need a renal biopsy. Renal function assessment is important because you see whether you need to do a renal transplant at the time of diagnosis. Again, this was the one we saw over here. Uh, point number seven, renal transplantation, uh, essentially where the GFR is less and uh, you guys want to assess whether the patient will need a renal transplant in future. Uh, last class, I had promised you on the group that I will explain how to calculate GFR, eGFR and all. I'll try to do that by this weekend. I'm so sorry for the delay. Anesthetic assessment, psychiatric assessment, and dietic review. Psychiatric assessment is very essential because these patients already have a lot of psychiatric morbidity. They have suffered a lot. Multiple surgeries they have undergone. Uh, you should also assess their ability to be compliant to medications. Uh, medical compliance is a very tough task in these patients because these patients need a heavy amount of immunosuppression. Which of the following organs is not included in a modified multivisceral transplant? It's a very difficult question to answer. There's not much of logic over here. Either you know or you don't know. What is the answer? Good. I'm glad that a lot of people are paying attention and listening to the classes or you know are reading before coming. So when you mean an intestinal transplant, you usually mean a small intestine and a colon transplant. It can be with or without pancreas. And when you do a small intestinal transplant, the anastomosis is near the DJ flexure uh, because that's where SMA territory uh, usually starts, approximately. When you talk about a, a complete uh, a liver and small bowel transplant, you're talking about small intestine, colon, pancreas, and liver. So here again, the anastomosis is going to be duodenal approximately. You, know? you do this in patients in whom uh, there is a concomitant liver failure or severe hepatic fibrosis. A modified multivisceral transplant is like a multivisceral transplant. A multivisceral transplant is the most extensive of them all. You do the small intestine, colon, liver, pancreas, but you also include the stomach. So this is in extensive disease where you have the celiac uh, uh, 
uh, where you have done this is not in, this is mainly done in patients with mesenteric ischemia where uh, multi vessel disease is seen celiac axis is also gone superior mesenteric axis is also gone inferior mesenteric axis is also gone so you want to uh, transplant right from stomach to the uh, colon colon depends on the level either you will run uh, do till uh, two thirds where the sma territory if the ima is also gone then you want to do it till, uh, as below as possible but most of the times in these cases we will put a ileostomy or uh, we will do a colostomy we will not go and try to transplant even the left colon that, that is usually not done we stop ourselves to the right colon usually a uh, modified multivessel transplant is aware triple vessel disease is done but uh, or some other reason for uh, transplanting the stomach but you avoid doing a liver transplantation so this is a modified multivessel transplant uh, learn it for academic sake but it is not a very uh, common thing to do because at that point of time when celiac axis is affected um, what is the blood supply of the uh, liver so the blood supply of the liver is essentially from portal vein and hepatic artery uh, so i think you will know it so portal vein is 70 to 85% of 70% of the uh, um, 60 to 70% of the blood flow and uh, rest is by the hepatic artery of course the hepatic artery even if it is only 20% of the blood flow the amount of artery gives is almost 30 to 40% uh, portal vein maximum 60 to 65% of the total oxygen requirement uh, but in some cases hepatic artery can arise from multiple other areas so does anybody can anybody tell me what is the most common variant of hepatic artery uh, origin so the most common variant of hepatic artery origin is a aberrant rha so don't say sma so the most common variant in hepatic artery is a aberrant rha it is closely followed by a aberrant lha so you can say about 50% so just so this is one of the indications for a modified multivessel transplant where the celiac axis is gone but the hepatic artery arises from some other place so if you kind of think about it there are multiple indications so if you guys are interested for about a minute i can tell you the variations in hepatic artery anatomy correct me if i'm wrong i'm just talking from memory can i proceed if you guys have time so what is type 1 type 1 is normal normal when i mean normal what i mean the hepatic artery common hepatic artery arises from the sorry uh, common hepatic artery gives rise to the hepatic artery proper and right hepatic artery left hepatic artery type 2 is left gastric artery is left sorry uh, left hepatic artery arises from left gastric artery so type 2 is lha from left gastric what is type 3 type 3 is the most common which is rha from what sma what is type 4 type 4 type 5 what is type 4 type 5 and type 6 so type 4 is a combination so lha from left gastric 2 plus 3 is 4 what is type 5 type 5 is the entire hepatic artery arises from whole common hepatic artery arises from sma what is type 6 Hepatic artery arises from from where? I think I have to talk myself from iota. So if I made any mistakes, do let me know. Uh, so Type 2 is LHA from left gastric, type 3 is RHA from SMA, type 4 is 2 plus 3, left, uh, left hepatic from left gastric and uh, right hepatic from SMA. Uh, type 4 is 2 plus 3, type 5 is hepatic artery from SMA, common hepatic artery. And uh, type 6 is common hepatic from iota. So if the common hepatic artery is arising from iota, 
you really don't need type one is normal Type one is normal. Any doubts over here? If I made a mistake, do correct me, guys. In this particular thing, yeah. Anyway, so uh, this could be one of the reasons for a modified multivessel transplant where the liver is normal, there is no uh, liver compromise, or even in the some of the other variations where it is arising from somewhere else, the artery supply is not compromised. But you need to transplant the stomach. You go in for a modified multivessel transplant where you don't transplant the. You're planning an intestinal multivessel transplant for your patient on long term plan. Which of the following is not true regarding your concerns while preparing for surgery? So I think a lot of you are getting it right. The intestinal cold ischemia should be very less. It's usually what is how much is it? Less than six hours. Sometimes it's ideally less than even three to four hours should be the ideal cold ischemia time. So you don't want to make sure that the intestine suffers from a high cold ischemia time. So if you know that the cold ischemia time is less in a intestine transplant, it also means that the donor and recipient operations need to occur simultaneously. The recipient operation is very challenging because of a hostile abdomen. Patients usually have severe amount of hepatic fibrosis. They would have undergone multiple surgeries. Very difficult. Preoperative embolization is done because you want to finish off the recipient transplant fast. So if you do a preoperative embolization, the patient, you put his bowel into gangrene because you're anyway going to remove it. You're not going to retain the old part of uh, liver or intestine. So you do a preoperative embolization to make sure that the uh, bleeding is lesser and the surgery is faster. So obviously, they are always done from disease brain dead donors. Are very difficult to do in DCD. So it's almost always only DPD. So this is to, uh, as I told you, you want to operate as fast as possible because of uh, the decreased cold ischemia time. So ideally, so it's less than six hours, but you know, ideally less, even less than that. Preoperative embolization can reduce blood loss significantly. I told you that. You scrub for an intestine transplant surgery. Which of the following is not a routinely followed step in your surgery? I know this is a tough topic, but if you look at this particular option, you don't need to know too much of surgery. You need to be smart. So look at the option and tell me which of the following option is wrong. If you MCQ solving MCQs is not our knowledge game. It is essentially a common sense game. And if you kind of look at it, a primary distal anastomosis with a covering gastrostomy. Nobody in the right mind would do a covering gastrostomy. They would always do an ileostomy for sure. So once you see the gastrostomy, you know it is wrong. So that is the right option. All the other options are right. We'll kind of go through the options uh, as we go through the text. This image is from Bailey and Love. They are you know, preserving the graft in uh, University of Wisconsin. So liver, stomach, small bowel, pancreas, everything is over there. So you retrieve the organs end block. So the vascular inflow is coming from celiac axis, SMA. Venous axis, venous outflow is either via the portal vein or if the liver is there, you always use the IVC directly because you take a part of the IVC. Repeat question number five. So which of the following is not a routinely followed step? If you kind of look at the options, the option is a covering gastrostomy. In no patient would you do a covering gastrostomy. You would always do a covering ileostomy. Why would you not do a covering gastrostomy? You don't want to drain the contents out right from the uh, stomach, uh, right from the stomach, because that defeats the entire purpose of your transplant, right? If you're draining out the contents from the stomach, what is the use of you doing a transplant? Anyway, it's going to be nutritionally compromised. So the reason you do a transplant is to wean him off parenteral nutrition. And if you want to wean him off parenteral nutrition, which means that you have to expose the gut to enough food, which is going to consume orally. So you don't do a covering gastrostomy. To prevent a leak, you do a covering ileostomy. Why do you do a covering ileostomy? 
This is when you do a distal anastomosis, especially when you do a coronic anastomosis. These coronic anastomosis are very prone for leaks. Usually, you even do an endiliostomy. In many of these patients, you do an endiliostomy. You don't even want an anastomosis. When an anastomosis is done, a covering gastrostomy is essential. For people who are in their first year of PG or your second year of PG, this might be a little difficult for you to understand. If need be, you can always contact me again and I can you know, explain this to you. We'll also be talking about this in our video lectures also which you're shooting right now. What I'm trying to say is that in patients whom intestinal transplant is done, in most cases, we do just put an ileostomy, end ileostomy or end colostomy. In some young patients, when you want to do an anastomosis distally, colonic anastomosis are notorious for leaks. So you do a covering ileostomy. Now some smart guy will ask, yeah, okay, somebody has asked me, covering and diversion are same? Yes, covering and diversion are same. So even in a case of an uh, anterior resection, LAR, you would the covering ileostomy or a diversion ileostomy or a loop ileostomy, everything is the same, basically. Some smart Alec might ask me, in an intestinal transplant, the maximum anastomotic leak is not in the colon, it is near the esophagogastric. So why don't you divert that? Again, we are evidently defeating the purpose. If you want to divert the esophagus, you can't do an esophagostomy uh, or mediastinal esophagostomy. That's not simply done. Okay. So, yeah. So, coming to the uh, this side. organs are retrieved end block. If there is no liver involved, the venous outflow, that is, the portal vein is the venous outflow and it is the it is anastomosed to the donor IVC, sorry, the recipient IVC. Okay. Usually, end to end, uh, sorry, uh, end to side or side to end, however you're doing it you can do, but usually the portal vein is anastomosed to the donor IVC, where liver is not included. When the liver is included, you do a side-to-side -side IVC anastomosis as we discussed in liver transplantation. Arterial inflow to the graft, that is, the donor has to give, where does the donor give the, this thing? It is from infrarenal iota. So, what is infrarenal iota, guys? At what level is the other renal arteries given off in a normal human being? Nobody knows. Somebody is going to do this homework for me. L2 level usually below the level of L2 is intrarenal aorta. And at that level, it splits at L4 level. We see the iliac bifurcation. You can see that on a CT as well. So at so basically. L2 to L4 level. So this is L4 level. This is L2 level where the renal aorta is given. Usually L2. Uh, L3 is a little. L4 is a bifurcation. So L4 bifurcation. So this region is where the donor uh, vessels are anastomosed. So it can be a SMA patch. Sometimes you use a thoracic aorta as a uh, arterial conduit which you anastomose over here. So whatever vessel is you want anastomosis, you anastomose it to the infrarenal iota. It really depends on the graph. You can have an iota, donor iota, where you have the celiac axis, IMA, SMA, or you can, you know, create an arterial conduit with iliac vessels, as we saw in uh, pancreas transplantation. You use an iliac vessel, common iliac, and uh, a common iliac vessel you take as a graph, and you anastomose the uh, SMA and the celiac vessels to the uh, external iliac and the internal iliac. So whatever conduit you're using, you anastomose it to the infrarenal aorta. So, so basically this is the thing. It can be, a uh, conduit can be fashioned from uh, vessels. Again, something which you've discussed, we are talking about uh, liver graft, you're talking about hepatic veins and IVC. When non-liver grafts, the venous outflow is via the portal vein. So when the reperfusion of graft, following reperfusion of the graft, enteric anastomosis are performed. So this requires a proximal enteric anastomosis and a distal stoma or anastomosis, which you have already seen. Some cases, multivisceral transplant, biliary anastomosis may also be required. The proximal anastomosis, depending on the level, it can be esophagogastric, esophagogenal, gastrogastric, gastrogenal, jejunogenal. It really depends on what, how much of intestine you are transplanting. So again, we have seen this. Uh, 
if you are doing an esophagogastric or a gastrogastric anastomosis, a pyloroplasty is needed. A pyloroplasty is a very simple procedure. This is basically to ensure that delayed gastric emptying does not take place because the uh, entire chunk of tissue, uh, which is, you know, uh, the donor and the recipient area, vagal innervation is poor. So, vagal innervation is lacking. So, these patients are going to suffer from gastric stasis. So, to avoid that, you do a pyloroplasty to drain the pylorus easily. And uh, many cases, a covering ileostomy is performed. An ileostomy also allows you for endoscopic surveillance. You can put an endoscope and do a biopsy. So, which of the following methods uh, aids in difficult abdominal closure post intestine transplant? So, which of the following methods are in difficult abdominal closure post intestinal transplant? Preoperative tissue expansion, transplant of the donor rectus sheet, vascularized pedicle graft. So, what are the vascularized pedicle grafts which are regularly used? Can somebody elaborate? So, yes, all the options are right. But what are the options which are kind of regularly used as vascularized pedicle grafts? If somebody is preparing for oncology, they should definitely know it because it is mentioned very clearly in which book? It is mentioned very clearly in MD Anderson. So you guys are going to uh, you know do this as a homework. So. There are multiple actually options uh, and uh, post the development of AWR, explosion of AWR as a speciality, the options for uh, abdominal closure have increased significantly. So I can actually talk a lot about it, but uh, what is going to be the first step when you are trying to close in difficult abdomen? What is going to be the first maneuver you are going to do? tar somebody has mentioned so even before tar what would you do so oh no 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 not restopa no 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 yeah you will have to do a restopa to do a tar all these patients require it would require component separation which is what people are trying to tell me as tar but one of the most important thing is that preoperative tissue expansion uh, preoperative tissue expansion can be done by multiple methods. Uh, pneumoperitoneum, progressive pneumoperitoneum PPP is possible. Another option is Botox. Uh, Botox can be given. There are very regular protocols for uh, how to do Botox. But in these patients, uh, they may or may not tolerate uh, these kind of uh, uh, things. So we can also do transplant of the donor and uh, so in most of these patients in many of these patients a simple extensive bilateral tar is more than enough and i mean a bilateral tar a transverse abdomen is released now to explain tar in this particular class is going to be a little difficult so i'm not going to talk about it but uh, basically when uh, you think about tar preoperative tissue expansion when there is significant loss of domain when I mean loss of domain, uh, what do I mean? What is loss of domain? Can anybody explain to me? So somebody has mentioned Tanaka Index. What is Tanaka Index? So today's homework for all of you guys is going to be, you guys are going to put it on the group. What is Tanaka Index? And this is way beyond what you guys have to know right now. But what is Tanaka index and what is Sabag ratio? So these two terms, somebody is going to tell me. And what is the normal values? Okay. So when the Tanaka index, Tanaka index is essentially how much of the bowel is out of the defect. Slight variation in Tanaka index and Sabag ratio, which you're going to do as a homework. But it essentially tells you how much percentage of the abdomen contents are outside the abdomen. So imagine the abdomen is like this. And this is 25%. It means that there is 20 to 25% is usually considered as the uh, value for which uh, we calculate Tanaka index. So in these patients, preoperative volume expansion, PPP, Botox or TAR might be essential. 
what is the newest device in market for abdominal closure to help in abdominal closure preventing a tar the person who tells that oh, no 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 newest newest the first case in india is going to be done on 26 november by the way a hey, not a saline expander man saline expanders we don't use it we can use it only for skin no biological meshes is not new biological meshes something very common so this is going to be demonstrated at the awr deep impact in uh, march also so if you want to see it uh, just saying oh yeah so yashwant i think uh, contact me after this you are going to get a special prize so this is face shield tens so face shield tens is the latest device uh, where uh, they apply facial tension you guys are going to do your homework on this so basically if you find to difficult to close an abdomen you create a artificial tension every 2 minutes or 3 minutes you will have to keep adjusting the tension on the uh, silk sutures or the vicral sutures so vertigo medial tension is what they say vertigo medial tension for uh, a, a significant amount of time half an hour to even one or two hours uh, pulls the tissue and allows you to approximate it so that is the principle of facial tens and uh, so facial tens is being regularly uh, used in europe now it is not indicated in um, what do you call in the west uh, in, in the uh, in us as of now the first case in india are going to be done uh, this is it so transplant of the donor rectus sheath so sometimes what they use is that they take a flap of so yeah all of the above so sometimes what they do is they take uh, the donor rectus sheath remove the rectus muscles and use it as a non vascularized sheet of fascia basically use it as a biological mesh basically you take the rectus abdominis graft so just leech and peritoneal complex just that is going to be there the muscle and that are removed that can be used as a uh, biological mesh okay so then the vascularized abdominal grafts are used uh, using inferior epigastric arteries so the anterior abdominal wall along with the deep inferior epigastric arteries are the regularly ones used for uh, transplantation so what are the indications for abdominal wall transplant I guess a difficult abdominal closure using an intestinal transplant. Yes, sometimes extensive enterocutaneous fistula due to Crohn's. Patient might not be in actual small bowel syndrome, but you still have too many enterocutaneous fistulas, too many fistulas on the skin and the abdominal tissue. People have done cases of um, abdominal wall transplant. Olden days when the our facilities for radiotherapy were poor. you would still uh, get a lot of abdominal wall fibrosis following extensive uh, radiotherapy sometimes you might have to resect the abdominal wall due to a desmoid tumor or a pseudomyxoma peritoneum you do it so how do you extract a abdominal vascularized full thickness graft so when you use this thing what do you call an abdominal vascular this thing you call it as a a w v C A. Can somebody expand V C A for me? Nobody. So V C A is vascularized composite allo transplantation. So it is not compost. Uh, somebody mentioned compost. Compost is a completely different thing. uh you would use compost in your garden it is composite don't take offense guys it's just uh the thing so basically you take the peritoneum the posterior rectus sheath both the rectus abdominis muscles anterior rectus sheath overlying fat skin parts of the external internal oblique everything you take it and then along with the inferior epigastric vessels uh again the inferior epigastric vessels are uh, anest most to the uh, recipient iliac vessels sorry recipient iliac vessels or sometimes even the recipient uh, inferior epigastric vessels so this is how you do an abdominal uh, vascularized transplant 
Okay. So there are certain techniques where you can do a partial thickness transplant. So just note the names, uh, not very important for you. So this might be useful for uh, those who are uh, preparing for your INESS testing. So there are two techniques. One is the Miami technique and the other one is the, um, what do you call, the Mount Sinai technique. So uh, I'm not going to be explaining too much about it, but Miami technique is where you uh, take the graft completely, but later on you separate, do a little bit of uh, component separation and use only the anterior lap lamina of the uh, rectus muscles and you don't use the other parts of it. So this is the Miami technique. The Mount Sinai technique is a little more complex to explain. Uh, and uh, so this is something which we'll explain in our GSOD EDSS lectures in detail where we will have a separate session on abdominal wall transplants uh, separately or we can add it in the video lectures. So just remember these names. Partial technique, partial uh, thickness techniques include Miami technique and Mount Sinai technique. The uh, technique which I mentioned before, where we take right from the skin to the peritoneum, that is the uh, uh, full thickness technique. And uh, expansion of ECA is important, vascularized composite allo transplantation. So, in this particular class, I have explained much more than what is given in Bayesian Law 28 edition. At some point of time, if you feel that this is too much of information, do stop me and correct me, sir. We came only to listen to uh, uh, Bayesian Law. You are uh, talking a little extra because so that I'll know uh, from feedback whether we are actually being really effective or not. One of the patients in the post transplant ward develops an enteric anastomosis leak. Which of the following is not true regarding his complication? So we have already spoken about everything else. Esophagogastric anastomosis is where maximum amount of leakage happens. Endovac, endovac, either you know it or you don't. I'll explain what is an endovac. I have some pictures as well. It presents atypically in immunocompromised patients. Immunocompromised patients, any form of illness, you present in an atypical fashion because their uh, levels of pain tolerance and everything is going to be completely different. Intraabdominal collections, you should act aggressively and do a radiological diagnosis. So the, this is a important table. I'm not going to be sitting down and explaining every part of the table, uh, but I'm going to be explaining the complications. So if you look at an enteric anastomosis leak, it most commonly occurs in esophagogastric anastomosis. All leaks in immunocompromise, it's not just in transplantation, even if you're operating, doing a simple uh, uh, dissection anastomosis in an immunocompromised patient, it presents in a very different pattern. Patients don't you know, present with severe peritonitis and all uh, because their immune reaction is already suppressed. So high index of suspicion is needed. Have a low threshold for re-imaging. You can go in for a USG or a CT as often as possible. Proximal leaks are very challenging to manage. They also have extremely high quantity. So one thing you should remember is that use of an endovac. I'll explain what an endovac is. Before that, I have to tell you that aggressive management of intra-abdominal collections is necessary and try to do it as soon as possible. And if necessary, you can do uh, modifications. You can you know restart uh, TPN and everything. Endovac is nothing but a sponge. So basically, there is a leak. Put a sponge. Put a suction over there. What it really does is that it suctions it. It allows, prevents the leak from expanding. And many times it heals on its own. In many cases, it deals with the stricture only, but it's still effective. Now remember these images, this might be asked for you in your exam. So intestinal transplant recently increased stoma output and diarrhea with fever is hypotensive. Which of the faults is respect uh, with respect to his condition? Difficult question. Let me see how you answer it. Last question of the day. Intravenous fluconazole started promptly is in the management of choice. No, that is definitely the wrong answer. Everything else is true. So what is he actually suffering from? 
So there are two DDs for this problem. What? No, I'm asking DDs. I'm not asking option D. So yeah, it is graft failure rejection. What is the other option? What is the other thing? It can be infective enteritis. It is either rejection or enteritis. They both present in a very similar manner. Uh, it is usually we are talking about uh, rejection in this particular patient uh, because all the other options are indicative of rejection. So in rejection, we will kind of talk about it. Acute cellular rejection can happen even a few months after the transplantation. Usually you use lymphocyte depleting regimens such as ATG or anti-CD52 valentuzumab. Pediatrics, you want to avoid non-depleting regimens. But uh, the main thing is that extreme amount of immunosuppression is necessary. And so immunosuppression comes with its complications. Acute rejection is manifested usually in the terminal area. Increased stoma output or diarrhea. So you might think, oh, stoma is working well, but it's not. Usually increased stoma output, diarrhea with fever is what kind of the thing. The intestine is extremely sensitive to all these sort of changes and it results in loss of intestine because a sepsis, septic shock can occur. The only way to prove it is endoscopic assessment, take a biopsy, crypt loss, ulcerations, apoptotic bodies in the base of the crypts. So remember, inflammatory infiltrate in the lamina propria, apoptotic bodies in the base of crypts, very, very important. So the only way to treat it is steroids. And uh, you treat it with high dose IV pulse steroid. Infection is very common. Whenever there is uh, immunosuppression, you require you have infection. Uh, EBV, antifungal, uh, cotrimoxazole for you know pseudomonas gervaisi, pneumocystis gervaisi. Uh, all these are essential, like any other major transplant. Infective enteritis is very common. This thing it you know it looks exactly like the, uh, acute cellular rejection. But uh, you will see that, you know, uh, uh, send a stool for culture and also viral polymerase. If you find high EBV load, uh, you will know that this patient is likely to have infective enteritis. So what is this particular disease right now? Which of the following is not associated with this condition? Which of the following is not? So yeah, so the answer is for sure. What is it? It is PTLD. So when you're talking about PTLD, we'll kind of discuss everything. So the management is not guided by peripheral T-cell chimerism. What management is guided by peripheral T-cell chimerism? It is graft to the root disease is what is guided by peripheral T-cell chimerism. So PTSD is a common problem in intestinal transplant. Why? Because of the amount of lymphoid tissue and also the levels of immunosuppression. PTLD with the common reason is EBV and persistent positive EBV viremia or B symptoms such as night sweat, unexplained fevers, weight loss, it tells you that the patient is likely to go in for PTLD. Treatment is with rituximab and immunosuppressive reduction. Uh, again, when you actually give immunosuppression reduction, you have to be very careful because this can result in craft rejection. So this fine balance is a very difficult thing to achieve. The other problem is graft versus host disease. Graft versus host disease, the classical triad is rash, fever, and bone marrow suppression. We really don't know how to manage graft versus host disease. Some people say reduce immunosuppression. Some people say increase immunosuppression. Very difficult to achieve an equilibrium. And uh, the management is guided for this achieving this equilibrium. You need to know the levels of peripheral T-cell chimerism. Uh, I read a little bit about it. For those who are interested, I can share a couple of papers on it. But I'm going to stop, uh, not discuss this too much because it will be a little too much for this particular course. The real problem is that bone marrow involvement and failure, if it happens, patients usually die. They hardly ever recover. From an MCQ point of time, remember that for any intestine transplantation, the most common cause of death is sepsis. Renal function, renal function deterioration is a very common problem in intestinal transplant, mainly due to very, very long surgery. Sometimes intestinal transplant can take longer because it's almost often multivisceral, much longer than even general uh, uh, renal or just liver transplant. High immunosuppression, nephrotoxic tacrolimus. Because you always have a uh, stoma most times, the output is higher. 
patient goes for electrolyte imbalance, AKI. So always maintain good hydration, avoid mTOR inhibitors, and sorry, avoid uh, CNI calcineurin inhibitors. Try using uh, uh, renal protective uh, drugs mTOR inhibitors. And uh, as much as possible, avoid drugs which affect renal function. Outcomes in multivisceral transplant units um, are poor all over the world, except in some of the good centers. In India, there are very few high volume centers. There are hardly any centers which do regular multivisceral transplant. But in some of the best centers, intestine only graft, the overall one year patient survival is greater than 80%. Where liver is involved, it is one year survival is greater than 70%. Five year outcomes are improving in many places, but the results are just coming out because many of these centers have started doing these things only over the last five to 10 years. So, long term outcomes are yet to be seen. So, we're going to be ending this class over here. If you have any doubts, you can ask me. The last slide, oh, the last slide was nothing. It was basically, uh, the last slide was basically about renal function and uh, outcomes I was talking about uh, intestine only grafts and liver containing grafts. So somebody has asked me uh, order of anastomosis. So now you guys have attended all my transplant class. So you're going to tell me what is going to be the order of anastomosis. So there are two anastomoses. So one thing is that you have seen that the vascular anastomosis is done first. They are uh, done first, and then you go for the bowel anastomosis. So its funda is very clear, boys and girls. It is always vein first and artery next. Why? So somebody has asked me in uh, triple vessel TVD, is it not good to reset the gangrenous bowel, shift to ICU, give the patient a chance and pray to God. See, the morbidity of removing the entire bowel is, are you going to offer the patient a transplant? So that is the question at the end of the day. So if you are going to do a transplant, then you can do the bowel and dressing it. But there is no point in removing the bowel in a triple vessel disease. That's what evidence says. I have removed bowel in one or two cases, but then I realize it's more of a surgical exercise than any benefit to the patient. TPN won't work if you are removing right there from uh, uh, top to bottom. As I told you, if the celiac vessel artery is damaged, the patient, the surgery, the, 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 the liver is also going to fail in uh, very soon. So unless you have the facility to offer a, 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 a Multivisceral transplantation, there is no point of doing uh, extensive bowel resections. And uh, yeah, so the thing is that vein is also always first because you want to avoid uh, congestion. So if you do the artery first, the entire thing will get congested. You cannot, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, salvage the organ after that. The, when you do the artery first and without doing the vein, what it also does is it leads to a lot of oxidative damage because of congestion first thing and then there's a lot of free radical injury because there's a tremendous amount of reperfusion and oxidative free radical damage happens so always it is vein and then artery it's very mathematical guys i think uh, we have spoken about transplants especially i've spoken about transplant four or five classes right now i know i've been a little too uh, extensive uh, it might be a little more than what you need for need assist but it's going to be definitely useful if you're preparing for any assist for sure uh guys uh thank you so much i just want to inform you that we are starting a research methodology course this research methodology course is not going to be a simple course it is going to be a very very useful course on systematic reviews where we teach you how to do a systematic review where we teach you how to go about analyzing all points uh, which are essential for uh, you know, uh, doing a meta-analysis or a systematic review. Systematic review, as you know, is the highest form of uh, evidence in any study. And you can do this even without um, going to the field, doing a major study or anything. So I would suggest that you utilize this opportunity. Uh, last batch, a lot of students kind of uh, utilize this and have created very good systematic reviews. So if you have any doubt regarding uh, joining a systematic review course, do let me know. Tomorrow, we are also starting our MRCS Part A test and discussion, which are going to be very extensive and very useful for all students who are preparing for MRCS Part A. Uh, tomorrow, we start off with the first class, which is going to be medical legal aspects of surgery and uh, UK health, which I will be taking. So, again, if you are interested, do let me know, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, have a good night.